it has endured. Our long national nightmare is over. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Make sure your seatbelt is strapped tight and low. We're taking off for another trip to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chaz Lichadella. This week, Destination Moon. We're going to be talking to one of NASA's top female astronauts about a giant leap for womankind. Back on Earth, we're going to be looking at Joe Biden's refugee plans and the purge of the anti-Trump Republicans. But first... <laughs> It was probably the biggest misstep of Joe Biden's first 100 days in office, failing to stop a surge in illegal immigration and then flip-flopping on a major refugee policy. This week, Biden's retreat was confirmed. From President Biden, a major policy reversal. The White House announcing it will allow more refugees into the U.S., capping the total admitted at roughly 62,000 this year. Last month, the White House got itself into a bit of a tangle when it backtracked from a pledge to increase the cap from 15,000 to 62,500 this year. That drew fire from progressive Democrats. They then abruptly reversed course, all in the space of about 48 hours. Well, his policy was was on Friday, was months before, continues to be to reach 125,000 refugees in next fiscal year. 62.5 was a down payment. OK, but then this week Biden announced that he was revising the United States annual refugee admissions cap to 62,500 for this fiscal year, but three paragraphs later admitted the sad truth is that we will not achieve 62,500 admissions this year. And then he said the full year goal of 125,000 will be hard to hit and we might not make it. So still a bit of fudging around the policies versus goals and caps rather than actual numbers of actual refugee people. And that's all because they're pretty concerned the immigration system, which was inundated with that surge in border arrivals earlier this year, just wasn't coping. That does seem to be under control, at least for now, though, Chaz. Yeah, it's fair to say that Fox News took a fairly active interest in Biden screwing up the border for a while there. Fox is the orange line on that graph. Those are the immigration reports on cable news. But note how those reports drop right off in the last few weeks. This is why. Kids stuck in the dodgy, prison-like conditions of Customs and Border Patrol custody fell from a record 5,700 in March to only 677 now. And those kids went from spending 133 hours in that dodgy Border Patrol custody to only 28 hours now. Whereas the kids in the much better and more maintainable Health and Human Services custody doubled from 11,000 to 22,000. So, the dramatic, graphic pictures of children in detention that were confronting Biden have been kind of taken care of. But the surge behind those issues hasn't gone anywhere. We're expecting that there are about 180,000 encounters on the border during April. Those figures are going to be coming out in the next few days. And they will be well above the last big surge in 2019. And those are just the border crosses we know about. The Border Patrol estimate that about 1,500 other people are crossing the border every day without getting caught. And some of those adults evading capture are bringing welcome presents with them. Just in one region of the border, the Border Patrol have intercepted 247 pounds of smuggled fentanyl in the last six months or so, compared to only 36 pounds in the 12 months before then. However, at least the Biden administration is beginning to finally turn their attention to reuniting some of the separated families left over from the Trump administration. They reunited four families this week and uh, turning their attention to the other 1,000 families remaining separated. A bit of a work in progress, that one. And all this is happening in the context of some real ambivalence from the American people. 69% of those polled by Pew said that the 11 million or so undocumented immigrants should be able to stay in the country legally, which is down a bit from 77% four years ago, but still strongly supported. On the other hand, though, 79% of people said it was important to reduce the number of people seeking asylum in America. And get this, 50% of people say it's important for America to ban asylum seeking entirely. Try to make sense of that one, John. 
Go figure people, Chaz. <laughs> For more, though, we're joined by Krish Omara Vignaraja, a former senior policy advisor to Democratic Secretaries of State Hillary Clinton and John Kerry and First Lady Michelle Obama. These days, she's president of the Lutheran Refugee and Immigration Service. Krish, welcome to Planet America. Thank you for having me. So, Chris, we, we've been hearing a lot in the last month or so about what's being termed as a crisis on the southern border, a surge of, of new arrivals there, particularly uh, unaccompanied minors. Would you say what we're seeing now is a lull before maybe a post-COVID surge, or has the crisis been overcome? Yeah, normally what we see at the southern border is cyclical, uh, meaning every couple of years, um, 2014, 2016, 2019, and of course now we are seeing a surge. And then it's seasonal, meaning that there is a peak season, uh, basically as it's warmer, um, but not too hot, we do see increased numbers. Um, so we will expect that we are entering peak season right about now. Now, of course, the big issue a few weeks back with a number of kids in border patrol facilities, uh, those numbers have since been slashed. But let's leave aside who's about to come. That child protection issue from a few weeks back, has it actually been solved or has it merely been hidden? Well, it certainly has been solved um, to a significant extent, meaning the jail-like conditions that CBP runs are not fitting for any child. But we've got to make sure that once they are moved from CBP to Health and Human Services, where there are child welfare experts who run uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, it is a much better hospitable environment for these children. But the truth is that's not their final destination. Uh, the vast majority of these children, meaning 85 to 90% of them, have a parent or guardian here in the United States. That's where we need to ultimately get them. So we've got to make sure that these kids are not stuck in these large warehouse facilities but that we're actually reuniting them with their family all across the country. Why does it take two and a half years to hear an asylum claim at the moment? And why has this problem not been fixed for decades? That's the million dollar question. Um, part of it is that we need to expand the infrastructure, uh, the legal adjudications, um, make sure that there are enough immigration judges to address the 1.3 million backlog um, in terms of hearing these cases. But part of it is also that we need to make sure that these individuals, these families are getting the support while they're having their legal claims adjudicated. Right now, we have a system that invests not just hundreds of millions of dollars, but literally billions of dollars in the private prison companies. And so if we were to actually reallocate that to a more efficient and effective immigration assist system to assess these claims, I think you would see uh, much more progress and, and um, you know, some, some addressing of, of this backlog. Chris, we saw a, a rare public misstep from Biden over the level of the refugee intake. First saying it was going to go up, then saying it's going to stay at the Trump level, then saying it's going to go up again, but that, that high level is actually just a goal, and now this week he says it's a goal that we're not going to reach anyway. So what do you make of all of that? Yeah, the, so the president signed something called the presidential determination. It essentially sets the cap or the target. You can view it in a couple of different ways. It's important to recognize that that target is both aspirational and inspirational. So part of setting a high goal is to signal to other countries that the United States is attempting to return to its global humanitarian leadership at a time when we see an unprecedented global need. But it is also operational in the sense that when you set that target high, the resettlement community here in the United States can actually use it to rebuild. We have had more than 100 offices shut in the last four years across the country. My organization, LIRS, had to close 17 offices. The truth is we can't build this infrastructure overnight, but we have begun the process in the last several months. We could certainly resettle more than the 15,000 that President Trump had set, which was an all time record low. We're not gonna to get to 62,500, but there is some symbolism and functionality in setting the number high like that. Chris, people on the right say that even when an asylum claim is rejected, 
no one ever gets deported. If someone gets into America, they stay in America unless they commit some horrible crime. Now, do you think that's true? I don't think it's true. And I think that the numbers bear that out. Um, once your claim is adjudicated and you do have an order of deportation, uh, the majority of those individuals are um, returned to their home country or to another destination. Um, I think that one of the issues that we do see is those who come to the country, um, come to the United States, are deported, who then return once again. And then that cycle, that cycle happens over and over again. I do think that that is a um, concern that both sides of the aisle are trying to address because it's obviously not helpful in terms of um, having a coherent process. It's also not recognizing that we do need to support more of these individuals and families as they return to their home countries and they reintegrate re there. Krish, based on your personal experience, having come to the United States with your family as a baby, do you think the America of 2021, the America that 47% of which voted for Donald Trump, who built his career on economic and racial resentment, is America as welcoming now to refugees as it once was? Americans do find themselves at a crossroad because by some polling, more Americans than ever before believe that immigration is a good thing for the country, eight in 10 Americans. On the other hand, we have seen that some of President Biden's executive orders have been some of the least favorable of the decisions he has made as president. And so I think part of what concerns me is the fear mongering, um, how much fiction has been uh, spouted even from the White House um, and to what extent Americans believe in that. I know my personal truths, which is that my parents fled a civil war in Sri Lanka and came to the United States when I was nine months old. And I know that that America was welcoming to us. And I know that my daughter's life will be easier because my own parents' lives were hard. And to me, that's the American dream. I think that is what organizations like LIRS and the communities that support us all across the country still believe in. I'm not gonna say that it is easy and we should take any of that for granted, but I do believe that I um, that there is hope that some of the actions we've seen in the last few months do make me believe that this president will restore the soul of this nation and that America will continue to be a welcoming country. Finally, Chris, demagogues often play off refugee numbers against asylum seeker numbers. Even though those are two different pools of people, the American public do not seem to see that. So. How do you stop Americans freaking out about refugees every time there's a border surge? We've got to stop conflating one program with the other, one pathway of immigration with another, because they are different. Refugees come to this country um, as the most extremely vetted of any immigrant population. It is a years long process. These are individuals who have fled religious persecution, war, violence, um, persecution uh, for even who they love. And so I think it's important for Americans to be a little bit more savvy and sophisticated, but that's also on policymakers to explain who these immigrants are, why they're important to this country, and why as a nation of immigrants, where 99% of us trace our ancestry to some place abroad, that this is critical to our country, that it's not just the right thing to do, but that it's the smart thing to do. That whether it's refugees or other immigrants, that they make our communities safer, they make our economy stronger, and they enrich the culture and diversity of our country. Krisha Mara Vignaraja, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Planet America. Nice connecting, take care. The most senior Republican to condemn Donald Trump over his role in the January 6th Capitol Hill insurrection and then vote for his impeachment looks like she's about to pay for it with her job. Wyoming Congresswoman Liz Cheney, the third highest ranked Republican in the House and daughter, of course, of former Vice President Dick Cheney, faces a party room vote next week, which is expected to remove her from that leadership role. Yesterday, Cheney doubled down in her criticism of Trump with an op-ed in the Washington Post condemning his continued refusal to accept the result of last November's election, writing, Republicans need to stand for genuinely conservative principles and steer away from the dangerous and anti-democratic Trump cult of personality. Meanwhile, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, a staunch defender of former President Trump, rather let the cat out of the bag this week with a hot mic moment talking off-air with a Fox News host. 
I think she's got real problems. I, 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 I've had it with, I've had it with her. It's, you know, I, I've lost confidence. Okay, so what happens now? Well, someone just has to bring a motion, but I assume that will probably take place. And I assume that's a pretty safe assumption, because Politico reported that McCarthy has lined up Representative Virginia Fox of North Carolina to introduce that formal resolution next week to give Liz Cheney the flick. And former President Donald Trump has weighed in as well with a statement of his own. Liz Cheney is a warmongering fool who has no business in the Republican Party leadership. Elise Stefanik is a far superior choice and has my complete and total endorsement. So we're going to find out next week who wins this particular battle. It's the Bush era Republican Party versus the Trump era and so far there are very few signs that Trump is going to lose. Trump rarely loses amongst Republicans. Mm. But can we go back to that Trump statement again? Trump says Liz Cheney is a warmongering fool and that Elise Stefanik is a far superior choice. Fair enough. After all, Liz Cheney only just introduced the Ensuring a Secure Afghanistan Act, which specified a whole list of requirements that must be met before America even considers withdrawing from Afghanistan. And that warmonger's bill was, ah, oh, co-sponsored by Elise Stefanik. And then you have Liz Cheney's pathetic conservative rating of only 78% from the Conservative Union, compared to Elise Stefanik's far superior rating of 44%. OK, let's forget conservatism. What about Trumpism? That's what Republicans really care about these days, and Liz Cheney only voted in line with the Trump position 92.9% of the time, according to 538, compared to Stefanik, who voted in line with Trump a massive 77% of the time. Interesting. So, OK, what's really going on here? Well, there's a pretty big clue from how this latest flare-up began. Democrats described Trump's election conspiracy theories as the big lie. So, much like he tried with the term fake news, Trump tried to rebrand the term to suit him. He wrote, The fraudulent presidential election will be from this day forth known as the big lie. Pretty transparent stuff. And then Liz Cheney immediately tweeted out the 2020 presidential election was not stolen. Anyone who claims it was is spreading the big lie. So she claimed the term right back from him. And then Trump had another go at her and then she had another go at him. I, I don't think the issue here is her impeachment vote. I think it's that she doesn't like letting Trump get in the last word. So her stouches seem to draw a lot of attention, sucking in the entire Republican caucus. That's certainly what Kevin McCarthy hinted on Fox News. No, th th there's no concern about how she voted on impeachment. That decision has been made. I have heard from members concerned about her ability to carry out the job as conference chair, to carry out the message. We all need to be working as one if we're able to win the majority. I think a good example of what I'm talking about was the moment that Cheney probably lost Kevin McCarthy for good. It was back in February. She was asked if Trump should speak at the Conservative conference. You believe President Trump should be speaking, or former President Trump should be speaking at CPAC this weekend? Yes, he should. Congresswoman Cheney? Yeah, that's up to CPAC. Now, she could have ended her answer right there if she wanted to. But no, she went on with it, and look how impressed Kevin McCarthy was with her choice. I've been clear in my views about uh, President Trump and, and the extent to which following, the extent to which following January 6th, uh, I don't, I don't believe that he should be playing a role in the future of the party or the country. On that high note, thank you all very much. <laughs> I personally think it's that instinct of Cheney's to back over Trump at every opportunity that's led to the events of this week, John. And of course, Trump goes on about the 2020 election a lot as well, and he also insists on getting the last word in. So I suspect we're going to be seeing many, many more rounds of this fight, regardless of what position Cheney holds. Yeah, we'll grab the popcorn. <laughs> it's not just Liz Cheney as well, feeling the heat from Trump types. Mitt Romney, the Utah Senator, former Massachusetts Governor and 2012 Republican presidential nominee, got a very unfriendly reception in his home state last weekend. Senator Mitt Romney was loudly booed by delegates. He's faced anger and backlash over his votes to impeach President Trump. Let's go ahead and play back what happened.
<laughs> OK, nice move there from Mitt, saying, hey, what do you think of Biden's first 100 dates while they're already booing? So it sounded like they were booing Biden instead, but uh, unfortunately for him, it was pretty clear very soon that some members of the Utah Republican Party just do not approve of old Mitt. Please, thank you. Show respect. OK, Senator, thank Thanks. you, Derek. Thanks, Derek. So, yeah, I understand that uh, I have a few folks that don't like me terribly much, and I, I'm sorry about that, but I, I express my mind as I believe is right, and I follow my conscience as I believe is right. So, a place for conscience, Mitt. <laughs> now, this isn't just about relitigating the past, of course, because according to the news site Axios, sources close to former President Trump believe he is increasingly likely to run in 2024 in a bid to return to the presidency chairs. I reckon those sources might be onto something, John, because mm. Trump isn't exactly being cagey about it. Are you going to run in 2024? Uh, the answer is I'm absolutely enthused. I look forward to doing an announcement at the right time. Uh, as you know, it's very early. But I think people are going to be very, very happy uh, when I make a certain announcement. And you know, for uh, campaign finance reasons, you really can't do it too early because it becomes a whole different thing. Otherwise, I'd give you an answer That's that correct. I think you'd be very happy with. But uh, so we are looking at that very, very seriously. and. Uh, all I say is stay tuned. Very subtle. Yeah, what a showman. <laughs> America has a new COVID target this week. 70% of the over-16 population with at least one dose in their arms by Independence Day, July 4th. Currently, about 56% are at least partially vaccinated, but it may not be so easy to reach that target. The numbers getting shots are actually going down at the moment. When COVID vaccines were first available, demand was high and supply was low. Now there are plenty of vaccines, but demand is dropping off. And why is there seemingly increasing vaccine hesitancy? Well, this kind of knucklehead stuff doesn't help. It's almost 4,000 people who died after getting the COVID vaccines. The actual number is almost certainly higher than that, perhaps vastly higher than that. The data we just cited come from the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, VAERS. Yes, they did. But what Tucker failed to point out is that those deaths reported to Vayers can be made by anyone. And crucially, Vayers is not designed to determine if a vaccine caused a health problem, including death. When hundreds of millions of people, many of them elderly, are getting vaccinated, thousands will die in the next few weeks. But that does not mean that they died from the vaccine. It is just a statistical reality. Like the fact that dozens of Tucker Carlson viewers will die watching his show tonight. He didn't cause those deaths, but he's probably going to cause a bunch of deaths in the future. Play the sting again. <laughs> Every single week, John. Mm. The right Tucker's going. That's going to be a spin-off show soon. I'm up for it. <laughs> but back to the theories for vaccine hesitancy we're talking about. One popular theory is that the Johnson & Johnson temporary pause a few weeks back affected vaccine numbers. People might have lost confidence in vaccines when they heard there might be a dangerous side effect. That might be what happened. Uh, after all, the share of people getting a first dose each day started falling right when the J&J pause occurred. And yes, the J&J vaccine numbers soon fell to zero, and that's where they still are, but also Moderna and Pfizer vaccine numbers started falling at the same time, and they are also still falling. So that is an interesting correlation. However... A major poll found that exactly the same share of people refused to be vaccinated both before and after the J&J pause. So that would suggest the pause did not affect hesitancy. Maybe if you look a bit deeper at those numbers, we can see what's going on. Get rid of the before figures, don't need them anymore. There are only 11% of people left who want to take the vaccine as soon as possible. Whereas there are still 19% of people who expect to take that vaccine either after some other people they know or most other people they know take it. I.e. they're not anti-vaxxers, they're just busy. I think America has until now been basically vaccinating the low-hanging fruit. The really super keen people are looking for a vaccine. So from now on, it's all uphill. Even ignoring the vaccine-hesitant people. Or maybe Americans are just finding it hard to load up Biden's vaccines website 
vaccines.gov. Visit vaccines.gov. .gov. Vaccines.gov. <laughs> Bottom line, though, Biden's July 4 target is still not good enough because it's only 70% of adults being vaccinated with one dose, not 70% of the population being fully vaccinated. 70% of the adults is actually 55% of the population. And that's OK in itself, because using Israel as a case study, they pretty much beat COVID when they approached 55% of the population, but they were fully vaccinated. So why don't we see how America is really doing, hey, state by state. They've had two states so far, Maine and Connecticut. They've only just fully vaccinated 40 of the population, not 55%. And they have two states, Mississippi and Alabama, that haven't even reached 25% of the population fully vaccinated so far. So there is a long, long way for America to go still. Although this will help. The FDA is expected to authorise Pfizer's vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds next week. So that means some more low hanging fruit will present itself. But on the other hand, they need to get a wriggle on because the Brazilian variant is starting to spread. It's now the second most common variant in America and it's thought to be twice as contagious as the other variants. And they're also slightly less dominated by the vaccines. The quicker America reaches herd immunity, the better. Oh, by the way, one more big bit of news. America is supporting the waiver of intellectual property protections for COVID-19 vaccines. What that means is that theoretically, generics of the major vaccines can now be produced and the world's poorer countries can get vaccinated a lot faster, which would might be bad news for the pharmaceutical companies, John, but it'd be great news for the world, theoretically. An important distinction between <laughs> the theory and the reality, of course, because some experts say it could be up to two years before those generics are able to be given to anybody. They've got to go through a potentially months-long process with the World Trade Organisation to approve this exemption to the IP laws. They've got to get the ingredients, the supplies, they've got to make the vaccines, they've got to decide, do we have to go through a clinical trial process again with the generic vaccines, or are they good to go? So all sorts of potential hurdles in reality. Absolutely. By the way, one of those countries standing in the way of a WTO approval on behalf of the pharmaceutical companies? Australia. Yeah, yes. Mm, makes you proud. <laughs> now, this week, former Senator Bill Nelson was sworn in as the new chief of NASA. The Florida Democrat has had a long association with the Space Administration. As a congressman, he actually flew on board the Space Shuttle Columbia back in 1986. To have the president and the vice president have this kind of confidence in an old buddy from the Senate is indeed one of the high honours that anyone could have. 78-year-old Nelson was sworn in by Vice President Kamala Harris, who herself this week was made head of the National Space Policy Council. As NASA Administrator, though, Bill Nelson has a heck of a job ahead of him if he's to meet the goal of returning to the moon in 2024. And in doing so, NASA has big hopes of making history again. When American astronaut Neil Armstrong became the first person to walk on the moon in July 1969, he seemed to flub his lines. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. NASA claimed it was patchy audio reception. Others suggested Armstrong's Ohio accent was to blame. Although Armstrong himself later admitted he made a mistake after 24 hours without sleep. But either way, the word A was missing. The line he'd rehearsed was, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Still, there was no doubt it was a man who had stepped onto the moon. The gendered language reflected cultural and linguistic norms of 1969. And the fact that while there were a handful of women in crucial engineering and computational roles at NASA, there were no female astronauts in the Apollo program. In all, 12 humans have walked on the moon, every one of them a man from Neil Armstrong's giant leap to when Jack Schmidt kicked a moon rock around two and a half years later. Go, roll! Look, I would roll on this slope, why don't you? When it came to women in space, it was the Soviet Union rather than the USA that led the way in 1963. 
Down to Earth, in a conventional way, came the man and woman who'd been in orbit at the same time. And as the first ever space girl, Valentina Tereshkova, here with Colonel Bukovsky, has won a place in history. What a triumph for Russian science. NASA scientists believe that female hormones would disrupt their ability to fly in space. In any event, there were no female fighter pilots to be trained up to become an astronaut, and it would be another 20 years before the first American woman went into space. In 1983, physicist Sally Ride took off on board the Space Shuttle Challenger. She was grinning with excitement even before she left the Earth. Even before the crowds here chanted, Ride Sally Ride, as Challenger took its supercharged journey into space. And liftoff, liftoff of STS-7 and America's first woman astronaut. Sally Ride still had a lot of ignorance to overcome. She was asked by male mission planners whether 100 tampons would be enough for a seven-day journey. Liftoff of STS-7 and America's first woman astronaut. It sure is fun. She even made the work look like fun, joining mission specialist John Fabian in the textbook deployment of two communication satellites. Things are a little different now. In all, 492 men and 64 women have been to space, although that gender imbalance and the assumptions that go with it are still creating occasional problems. First ever all-female spacewalk has been cancelled. That historic walk by two NASA female astronauts was scheduled to take place on Friday, but NASA says there's only one space suit that fits both women that only one that size suit will be ready on Friday, so the walk will have to take place with one male and one female astronaut. In the 1990s, NASA needed to save money, so they stopped making extra small and small spacesuits, putting a higher demand on the supply of medium-sized suits. As a result, they ran out. In 2017, 45 years after Jack Schmidt became the last man on the lunar surface, he was at the White House to hear President Donald Trump announce plans to return to the moon as a stepping stone to Mars. What do you think, Jack? Where's Jack? What do you think, Jack? Uh, we'll find some other places out there. There are a couple of other places, right? The new Artemis lunar program is named for Apollo's mythical twin sister. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024. And, true to its name, Artemis plans to have a woman be among the next group of humans to walk on the moon. We are moving very fast. We have a new directive to get the next man and the first woman to the South Pole of the Moon in 2024. There are a lot of technological and budgetary hurdles to overcome before anyone lands on the moon again, but at least they look like they've finally fixed the spacesuit problem. Christine is wearing a spacesuit that will fit all of our astronauts when we go to the moon. And joining us now is NASA astronaut Sunita Williams. She spent a total of 322 days in space during two missions aboard the International Space Station. Sunny Williams, welcome to Planet America. Oh, it's my pleasure, John. Happy to be here with you today. Sunny, we just ran a report talking about the ridiculous number of tampons that Sally Ride was offered for a short trip to space. Have you ever encountered any of those kind of logistical or other issues around being a woman in the space program? Honestly, I haven't felt any uh, issues here. You know, obviously, the space walking suit, the EMU, is is a little bit difficult to work in. And generally, women are a little bit smaller than men, so that obviously brings up a physical, um, a slight physical barrier to size. But um, beside for that, just on a working level, no. And, you know, the EMU just makes you um, understand where the limitations are of, of difficult space hardware and understand how to, you know, work with it and, and then be successful. I've been lucky. I've, I actually got to do seven spacewalks, so I'm, I'm a pretty lucky person. And, Sonny, there's a lot of interest now in NASA's plans to return people to the moon in the next few years and to have a woman amongst that crew. Do we yet know? Has it been confirmed whether the, the woman is going to be the first back onto the moon? Oh, no, it hasn't been confirmed. We have named um, people in our office to be part of the Artemis cadre, um, and in all reality, all of us are part of Artemis, the Artemis cadre. You know, we've been working on the Orion capsule for a, a while now, and we've a lot of us have throughout the years have been um, test subjects for the architecture of the cockpit, for example. Um, but in reality, we know that you know it's a little bit 
after potentially my time. I've been here for 20 years plus. Um, and so that's, you know, we're, hopefully we're, we, the older generation have set up a good foundation for the new generation to take those big steps. And we're training them along the way with our commercial vehicles, you know, the, uh, of course the SpaceX Dragon and the one I'm working on, which is the Boeing Starliner, um, carrying forth our experience from Soyuz and the space shuttle program. So, you know, we're, we're all working toward that goal and uh, we're going to get there one day and uh, you, you will see the first woman on the moon, I am sure. It's hard to believe that it is almost 50 years now now since there were humans on the moon. Why has it taken so long to get back and why is it so difficult? We've already got the technology to do it, haven't we? Yeah, you know, I'll just hats off to the folks in the 60s and 70s who did it. It was, it's incredible. Um, but, you know, of course, over the last couple decades, we've had huge jumps in technology. And so we want to uh, put all that technology into these spacecraft. We, you know, we've become a lot smarter and we can make safe spacecraft a lot safer, a lot better, a lot more autonomous um, since based on the what we've learned in the past. And so, yeah, it, it is hard, but um, we're getting there in a better way. Uh, in addition to that, you know, making rockets is is no small feat. It's it's hard work. Um, there's there when you want to launch something off of this planet, you're on the cutting edge of the weight balance, right? Everything, everything that you put on that spacecraft, you want to make, you want to optimize it. These spacecraft that are going to go there are bigger than Apollo, uh, will carry more astronauts, uh, will have a longer stay in, in conjunction. We're working on a, uh, a space station uh, gateway that will be in lunar orbit that will help us um, be able to make us sustainable, uh, our work on the moon, allow us to go up and down from the lunar surface. So there's a lot going on to this uh, architecture to make it not just a, you know, a trip there and a trip back and that's it. We really want to go there, stay there, learn stuff, um, alternate crews, and really make that the test bed for when we want to leave this home of Earth and the moon when we really want to go on to Mars. So there's a, a, a much bigger ambition of what we want to do with this um, plan when we go back again. Um, and we're trying to involve as many commercial companies as well, because that is also helping people not only in the government, but all over the country and all over the world uh, work together to make this project happen. So what would you say were the best and the worst things about all that time you spent on the International Space Station? Yeah, I, I think, um, so the worst things, I, I, that's few and far between, but I think really missing family and friends. That was the, the biggest thing. And I think a close, not a close second, but a second is losing stuff. When you, It's a whole different mindset when you're up in space and you're, you know, here on earth, we put something down on the table or it drops to the floor and it's easy, but up there, you know, you can spend a lot of time looking for stuff because stuff floats away. Luckily on the moon, uh, there'll be a little bit, there'll be a little gravity there. So it will help us out again. So that second thing, I don't think we'll have to worry about so much, but the first thing of missing family and friends is, is, is tough and missing events and birthdays and anniversaries and things like that. Um, but you know, the return on investment or the return is, is huge. When you look out the window and you can see our beautiful planet, you can look out without uh, any, uh, you know, moisture in the atmosphere and you can see a million billion of stars out there. You, you know, it's just an incredible, incredible view. And it really puts things in perspective. I quickly mentioned the international nature of our return to the moon. Um, we really want to do that with other uh, countries, agencies involved with us. I mean, it is, um, that is, that is a huge thing. And we all come from one planet. I think that's the biggest impression that I got from being on the International Space Station with my international partners. You sort of forget that they're from other countries. They're your brothers, they're your sisters. And when you look at the earth, you go like, oh, that just seems so natural. You know, we're all here on one planet together and we really need to explore together to help maintain our species on this planet. I'm interested to know, given that you spent more than 300 days in the sort of the lockdown of the International Space Station, I'm wondering, did that help you uh, dealing with the COVID pandemic and the lockdown that so many of us endured last year? Were there things in your training that you were able to apply? Yeah, you know, um, I do feel like all of us who have spent time in isolation, be it on the International Space Station, maybe in you know, winter over in Antarctica, 
um, and you know, and really had to work on communication. Particularly, I you know, I flew on the space station a number of years ago, and we didn't have as great of communication as we have now. Um, how you deal with that, how you understand that, how you prepare yourself for that, um, it was definitely helped. I think in this whole pandemic. Um, my family is spread out throughout the country, so I didn't really get a chance to see people for a little while, but really made a point to do things like this, have a Zoom conversation, have a conversation on the phone, FaceTime, whatever, um, just to stay in touch and not forget about other people when you're stuck in your own little area. Um, another thing, you know, that was really nice for my neighborhood we bonded together because we were all sort of hanging out in this on the same street right so you can't avoid those people <laughs> so we would you know socially distance and get together and that is mirrors what we did on the space station so uh, you know we would have dinners at um on the weekends at least but maybe you know a couple times during the week uh, folks would be working on the u.s side of the space station or the russian side or in the you know the japanese laboratory we don't see each other when we're working Working. But at night, at least on the weekend, really try to get together and talk about, hey, you know, what have, what have you been doing? How's your family on the ground and things like that? And um, that's what we mimicked essentially just naturally on my street, on my simple street where I live. And, you know, I got to know the neighbors pretty well. I got to know their kids pretty well. I like to work out. I made the kids work out with me a couple times a week and um, we, you sort of make the best of it. But at the same time, you know, keeping in touch with your fa your own family and friends. Sonny Williams, thanks for your time. Great to have you with us. John, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Social media giant Facebook has upheld its ban on Donald Trump, the one it imposed after it found the former president incited violence during the January 6th attack on the US Capitol. Facebook's largely independent oversight board, described by founder Mark Zuckerberg as their supreme court, found Trump, quote, created an environment where a serious risk of violence was possible. But the board also directed Facebook to revisit what the panel called the company's, quote, arbitrary and vague decision making, giving it six months to justify and clarify whether this ban should be permanent. So it's a bit of a punt, really. Facebook itself has to decide whether to deplatform Trump permanently, and that's kind of what the Supreme Court was for, Chad. Yeah, although the Supreme Court didn't exactly hold back. Mm. Uh, that, that, that oversight board basically accused Facebook of passing the buck. They said, in applying a vague, standardless penalty and then referring this case to the board to resolve, Facebook seeks to avoid its responsibilities. And the board then declined Facebook's request. So they're certainly independent at the very least. Yes, but not necessarily helpful in all this. <laughs> and it matters too, because while Trump has got other social and broadcast media outlets at his disposal, Facebook has an unrivaled ability still to micro-target messages to potential supporters, generate votes and, most importantly perhaps, campaign contributions. Donald Trump spent nearly $140 million on targeted Facebook ads during the last election, but he reportedly raised more than three times that amount in donations. And while he has a chance of being allowed back onto Facebook in six months, Trump remains permanently banned from Twitter, which was his primary form of communication online during his presidency. But this week, Fox News claimed an exclusive, reporting that Trump had launched a, quote, communications platform, which was a place to speak freely and safely with his followers. And that platform? From the desk of Donald J. Trump. Seems at this stage to be what is commonly referred to by experts in information technology as a website. And as for speaking freely, there is no comment section, except of course from Trump. Free speech has been taken away from the President of the United States because of the radical left lunatics who are afraid of the truth. But the truth will come out anyway bigger and stronger than ever before. <laughs> Twitter has taken down two Trump desk accounts this week as well. Oh, and a quick fact check. I know, it's hardly worth it. But Donald Trump is not the President of the United States. He is a former President, although he does retain the title of President Trump for life, as do all former Presidents, because he lost! Yes, we should also say this is not the super-duper social media platform that Team Trump promised a few yeah, months telling ago. telling me. <laughs> Trump advisor Jason Miller said the website is not a new social media platform, but his team would have new information about a social media platform soon. But, you know, 
This is still the perfect site to visit, John, if you want to retweet Trump's statements and you're too old and confused to know how to attach a picture, <laughs> i.e. almost all his supporters. Mm, good plan. First time we took a fireside chat and this week chairs a lot of interest in this audit that's been conducted in Maricopa County in the great state of Arizona a state that uh, Joe Biden won narrowly over Donald Trump in November last year they've had uh, a couple of audits already they've had a formal recount and now the state Republican senators have commissioned uh, yet another audit what is going on and just to be clear this yeah. audit that they have commissioned yes is with a private firm. Yes. Has no experience with elections whatsoever. Sounds good. Who tried to keep their methodology secret mm. until a court forced them to make it public. And even now, most people don't seem to understand what's going on anyway. There's UV lights involved. <laughs> They're looking They're... for watermarks yeah. that uh, the internet would have you believe are on legitimate ballots. Yeah. There are no watermarks on ballots. So they're looking for watermarks that do not exist. But, but the key here mm. is that the chain of custody of those ballots has long been broken. Now they've just given it to some private firm who, which, who, which no one's supervising. Which, which means is... even if they found something, even if there was something to find, right. there's no proof. Because, right. because the, the chain of custody has been broken. There's meant to be a two-year period where state election officials, independent election officials, retain physical custody yeah. of ballot papers. So this has just been handed over to some crowd from Florida. Yes. OK, so... Yeah. They, and so no th checks or balances. No so, checks or balances. So, yeah, this so, so, right. so, so, so yeah, my point is that, mm. that even if there was something to what they were saying, this process will not... They won't be able to prove it. anything. Exactly. But they could potentially be able to raise suspicions or confirm the, uh, the uh, as so far, unproven doubts that Trump supporters have that there were a, uh, a bunch of fake votes in Maricopa County that gave the state to Joe Biden. So Maricopa County ha is, is one of the more democratic mm. regions of the state. But still, this sounds like it's going to resolve nothing and just kind of have people dig into their entrenched position. Yeah, all it does is create more doubt for people who want to believe that there's doubt, namely right. Donald Trump. And it's costing taxpayers tens of millions of dollars, by the way, yes. to determine absolutely nothing. There was an interesting vote uh, the other day for... And it went along party lines. Uh, Democratic House uh, members voted in favour of making Washington, D.C. a state. The argument yes. has long been no taxation without representation. Washington, D.C. is bigger than a couple of states, like yep. Wyoming, for instance. Yep. So why shouldn't they have uh, members of the House and also two senators if they became mm. a state? Uh, Republicans push back on that and say, well, DC's done pretty well out of being a federal city. Uh, it was always meant as a capital not to be a state because it muddies the whole line between federal responsibilities and state responsibilities. Oh, and by the way, it's a 90% Democratic state. You're going to get two Democrat senators for free. You're stacking the Senate. Where's it all up to now? Well, where it's up to is that it's over because Joe Manchin's saying no way. They could only get 46 co-sponsors of the bill in the Senate anyway. So not, it's not just Joe Manchin. They, they weren't going to get to 50. So they, they can't even get through reconciliation. So it's not going to happen for that reason, which is uh, it's slightly frustrating. I mean, we should say, by the way, Washington, D.C., they do get some representation, mm. which is in particular they count for the presidential election. They get some electoral college votes. Yep. But, yeah, they don't have senators in yep. particular. It, and it, they don't have the same voting rights in the House. They're, they're at large representatives yeah, and yeah. so on. And this is kind of a, a, a debate that's similar around Puerto Rico often gets talked about in terms say, of, of statehood as well. I was going to say, Puerto Rico is not so one-sided mm. as DC would be. And they're mm. kind of getting ignored in all this, which is mm. a shame because I think they have a much more legitimate claim. Like with DC, there is a serious argument about whether you'd need a constitutional amendment or not for various reasons I won't go into now because it'll bore people. Manchin has said that would be the only mechanism he would mm. consider it if there was a constitutional amendment. Exactly, yeah. And there is an obvious other solution for DC, which is have it get subsumed by... Or at least the people get mm. subsumed by Maryland. Yeah. Which are right next to them. Yeah. So, so if they want representation, it's easy for them to be part of Maryland. Yeah. And, I, and I haven't heard yet a Democrat explain why... Maryland couldn't do that. Now, Maryland have voted to not do that yeah. because they're a Democrat state and they want to get the extra two Democrat senators. Right. But if we're being fair dinkum about this, there are other ways that those guys can get a vote. 
Whereas Puerto Rico, there are no other ways they can get a vote. They've been completely ignored and they've got like 43% poverty right there. They need some help and they've been ignored. Yeah, so. and, and of course th this is a, a debate that often flows on from debates about reforming the filibuster, for instance, uh, because the Senate, because every state gets two senators, whether you are Wyoming with 600,000 people or you're California with close to 40 million people, you still get just two senators. Mm. So the American Senate is by design not strictly representative or majoritarian in its functioning. Uh, but it's been stacked in the past. You know, there's a reason we have two Dakotas, yeah. for instance. That was so Republicans got uh, got four senators out of what is one pretty small territory originally. Yeah, and that's an argument that gets used by Democrats a bit. The Republicans basically own the Senate because in the late 1800s they added what four or five states that they yep. really didn't they really shouldn't have added to just stack the Senate yep. and they're saying well it's our turn to stack a bit and the reason they did that <laughs> stacking to be fair to the Republicans at the time mm. it was so they would have enough to outnumber the southern democratic slave states mm. so this was all done about you know liberating black folks from slavery so at the time it seemed like a very good idea it's only in retrospect <laughs> that suddenly things have flipped around but they before will. we go it is time for us to enter onto the no malarkey zone that's a bunch of malarkey now, did you see this photograph of Joe and Jill Biden with former President Jimmy Carter and former First Lady Roslyn? It looked a little bit odd to a lot of people. The Carters look so very, very small, especially Roslyn there next to Joe Biden. Now, the picture, we should say, is genuine, but it's the perspective that is misleading. When he was president, for the record, Jimmy Carter, 177 centimetres tall, about 5 foot 10 in old money. Joe Biden is 182 centimetres tall, that's about six foot tall. Jill Biden is reportedly an inch taller than Rosalind Carter. So let's look at that photo again. So Jill Biden is four inches shorter than Jimmy and Joe is seven inches taller than Rosalind. And of course it is true that as people get older they can tend to lose a couple of centimetres in height and they can get hunched up and the Carters there are kind of slumped back in those easy chairs as well. But the answer as to why it all looks so very peculiar, it is a simple optical illusion created by a wide-angle lens in a relatively small room, so it's not that far back. And it does make things in the foreground, so in this case Jill and Joe, look disproportionately large. That is the same reason, Chaz, that Jimmy Carter's shoes, what's going on with them? <laughs> it's like he's come out of a clown car. And it is also the same reason, by the way, why this squirrel looks enormous, that's just a regular sized squirrel. Why these kids look really, really small, they're tiny, Mum. And this person seems to be holding the sun in their very fingertips, ouch. So, no, the Carters are not secret hobbits, this isn't some <laughs> big scoop and scandal. Although I am sure that Joe the Giant is going to become a thing on the internet soon if it's not already. Yes, absolutely. By the way, there was a bit made of the fact that in that photo, Joe Biden wasn't wearing a mask yes. when he posed so close to Jimmy Carter, who's like 90 and frail. Mm -hmm. and obviously, both of them would be vaccinated, but Biden, only a few days earlier, did have this to say about or being around vaccinated people. So it's like, look, you and I took our masks off when I came in, because look at the distance we are. But if we were, in fact, sitting there talking to one another close, I'd have my mask on, and I bet you'd have a mask, even though we've both been vaccinated. And so it's, it's, it's a small precaution to take that has a profound impact. It's a patriotic responsibility, for God's sake. So, look, what he said there does actually contradict his behaviour around the Carters. That is true. But he was right when he was around the Carters. CDC guidance is very clear about small groups of vaccinated people being safe to congregate indoors without masks. So I'm not really sure why people are trying so hard to nag the Biden administration to becoming mm. more hardcore with masks, and they already are. They're really into masks, generally. Kamala Harris and her husband have even been kissing each other through masks. <laughs> I think they might be careful enough, OK? <laughs> but, uh, look, we can't end the show, though, without the biggest scandal of the week. R bigger than Joe Biden trying to kill Jimmy Carter, you mean? Or will you wait? <laughs> Dandelion Gate. All right, folks, I want you to take a look at this. Joe Biden today getting on Marine One, and he stops and picks up, I think it's a dandelion, but it's a dandelion that hasn't even blossomed into a flower yet. Like, it gives everybody asthma. So you blow it, it goes everywhere, and then everybody starts sneezing. Well, he picks up the weed, 
and gives it to Jill as what I guess is supposed to be some kind of a sweet gesture. He's getting dandelions all over the place. I say it was a planted dandelion there, who knows? It's a plant in all senses of the word. America, this is why you can't have nice things. <laughs> a guy plucks a dandelion for his wife. He just happens to be president and suddenly it's cable news fodder. Jeez, it's not a bad week you're having when that's the best they can do to try and attack you. Yeah, maybe <laughs> has so. To be so. Anyway, that's malarkey. Indeed it is. And we will be back with another action-packed trip to Planet America at or about the same time next week. You can find us on ABC iView, YouTube and Facebook. And for more, you can download the Pet Podcast right there with Dr Dave in all the usual pod places. Bye-bye now.